When dominoes are placed in a line with each about 50% in a progressively larger, 50% than the one before it, then a domino the size of a tic-tac could knock over the 13th domino that's about a meter high and weighing about 46 kilograms. Furthermore, a progressively placed 29 dominoes could actually wipe out the Empire State Building. Well, that phenomenon has me wondering, what would be the equivalent to that first small domino that could set off a chain reaction and transform STEM education in Canada? STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. Why do I care? Well, science and technology innovation is transforming our world. And STEM underpins the grand global challenges that we're facing today, from climate change to providing clean, safe drinking water, sustainable energy, food security, and health care for the world. And science and technology is transforming our jobs today. In fact, at Let's Talk Science, we compiled a series of top 10 jobs that were available in public sources, and we color-coded them. Here's what we found. Green, traditional STEM jobs. Orange, STEM-heavy skilled trades. Blue, STEM skills and capacities are required. I think the colors speak for themselves. As we move forward in the next decade or two, about 70% of our top jobs require or benefit from STEM-related skills and capacities. But even more than that, all jobs benefit from the kinds of skills that STEM education leads to. Problem solving, critical thinking, teamwork, collaboration, communication. But how are we doing as a country? Well, in working with ministries of education across the country, we're finding that fewer than half of our students are leaving high school with the, high, with the upper level STEM trade programs. And in fact, with 17% completing physics, four to five of our kids aren't even eligible to apply for university engineering programs in spite of the rapid growth in that demand for those programs. That's probably why many of the universities are now reevaluating whether they will use that as a prerequisite. But beyond all the statistics and the numbers, it's really important that we talk about this issue because of our kids. I want you to meet Dylan. Dylan is a two and a half year old daughter of one of my colleagues at Let's Talk Science. In 2067, Dylan will be the age that I am now. That makes me wonder, what is my role? What is our collective role in making sure that Dylan is actually ready for a rapidly transforming world? It's not often that we pause to look forward or reflect back for context. And it's probably a little bit trite for me to say that the world has changed a lot since I was Dylan's age. But here's a telephone from when I was Dylan's age in 1967. Yes, yeah, she could walk with a telephone, but only as far as the cord that tethered us to the wall would allow. Now we take our phones everywhere. And in fact, big industries are gathering around the use of the mobile phone. When I was Dylan's age, Jungle Book was one of the top grossing movies at the time. And the Jungle Book used some of the most sophisticated technology available at the time. Xerography. It was more sophisticated technology around photocopying, but it was the first movie that did not require hand drawing on every frame. In the past year, some of the top 10 blockbusters all also benefited from the most advanced technology, whether it's 3D, whether it's drone photography. Worlds are colliding all around us. We really do live in fascinating times. Advanced manufacturing, artificial intelligence, space travel, synthetic biology. It's a fascinating time to be alive. This is a picture of a school from when I was Dylan's age. And this is a typical school nowadays. I think K-12 education is the most important investment that a society can make. We're living in an era of incredible transformation. How can we be sure that all of our kids will actually be ready for it? As we look towards finding that domino that can set off a, train, a chain reaction and benefit all kids, we need to understand the system a little bit better. So you know there's only five million school-aged children 
in this entire country. That's about 20% fewer than in the state of California, and about double the number of school-aged kids in the city of Shanghai. In Canada, every jurisdiction has responsibility for education. We have no national ministry of education. Canada is the only developed country in the world that has no national ministry of education. That causes a complexity to arise when we want to take a look at systems change in the country. I think education is top tier in Canada, but we have to reframe it. We have to rethink it to ensure that all of our kids are ready for a transforming economy. It's not surprising with the growing demand of STEM innovation that there's a lot of talk about putting more STEM into schools. But are we having the right conversation? And in the complexity of the environment, how do we actually scale so we can reach all young people? I've been talking about STEM, but when I go out and talk about STEM, that usually ends up with the friction of we need A for arts and turn it into STEAM. What about D for design? What about M for music? What about B for business and H for humanities? So we're spending a lot of time talking about subject areas, talking about disciplines, and talking about acronyms, when in fact, I think we really have to be putting kids into the center of the argument. So as we look for that domino to transform education, what do we know about our kids? Well, when it comes to gender-based issues, the international tests are pretty clear. There is no gender-based difference in performance in science. And more girls actually aspire to pursue STEM-based careers than boys. But girls tend to veer towards the biological or life sciences. Boys tend to veer towards the engineering and technology areas. And of growing concern, Few of either, only 3% of boys and 0.3% of girls are aspiring to information communications technology careers. So in an era when the computer science disciplines are rapidly growing, almost none of our kids are interested in that. In addition to the aspiration and the capacity, we do know that girls are pretty hard on themselves. And girls tend to underestimate their abilities. Boys tend to overestimate their abilities. And persistent gender bias does exist towards adult men in STEM areas. We also know that teens place great importance on values as they're thinking about their futures. It's really wonderful to see that the vast majority actually want to make a useful contribution to society. They want to help people. They want to be able to make decisions. And they want to solve problems. So given the fact that our participation rates are not as high as they might be, I think we need to do a better job in building the connection between the values that our kids have and the aspirations that they might have. We also need to do a better job in confronting some of the misconceptions. Far too many young people believe that problem solving is not actually critical to STEM or core to STEM, or that you can have an interesting career. And 30% think that you don't require teams in order to succeed or use communication skills. Now, this is not an issue only for Canada. And in fact, there's been some very interesting research done out of Norway that is showing an inverse relationship to the wealth of the country and young people's aspirations towards STEM. In fact, in countries like Canada that are developed, we tend to see more of a consumer attitude towards technology. Whereas in developing countries, kids see STEM as a way up and a way out. There's also been some fantastic research out of the OECD on key barriers to engagement. And we find that relevance is really important for young people. Exposure to inspirational and motivational role models is critical for thinking forward, as is access to clear pathways to post-secondary and career choices. Teachers need to be resourced and trained and able to bring this kind of programming to life. And parents are actually the number one influencer of the optional credits and post-secondary pathways. So parents need to be supported as well. Let's Talk Science has tackled these different barriers to youth and educators in the work over the last 25 years. We mobilized an amazing network of volunteers from more than 45 universities and colleges. We provide learning experiences in classrooms, in community settings, and through digital programming. 
And we know that our programs are making a difference. We keep kids like Dylan in the center of our thinking, and our evaluations are showing that we're having a positive effect. We're building skills, we're building positive attitudes towards STEM, and improved intentionality to pursue STEM programming at post-secondary and in the career phase. But we have to do more. We are on a quest to find that education domino. And over the past year, we've launched a bold new initiative called Canada 2067. That is an attempt to bring the country together to forge the very first national vision for STEM learning and clear, measurable outcomes so that we can ladder up together and help to help ensure that young people are ready for their future. If we just imagine, imagine if we can create, co-create a national vision. What if, for example, all young people need to be participating in a multidisciplinary, issues-based STEM credit for graduation? And what if that credit was infused with Indigenous ways of knowing? What if every student needed to participate in a work placement before they graduated? What if teachers had the resources and the training to bring these kinds of programs to light? What if Let's Talk Science and other NGOs like ours also ladder up to a common vision and goal? What if governments committed just a very small proportion of their science research budget to achieving common goals and outcomes? What if industry committed just a small amount of money that they're already putting into communities to support education, to help to pull together a national vision and achieve these objectives? Just imagine the kinds of opportunities that would await Dylan and all the kids around her. I think it's important for us to take an inclusive and a bold approach to education as we move forward. This is an opportunity for us to look for that small domino, even though the education environment is complex. It can be really daunting to think about large-scale change and systems change, but if we look towards the domino factor for inspiration, perhaps it's that common vision and the common objectives that we can each make some small behaviors and contributions towards to help unlock the potential energy and help to change the system within the country. We owe it to Dylan for us to work together and try. I invite you all to join Let's Talk Science on this quest. Thank you.